Hello, I'm Rochelle Duty, Professor of Neurology, the F.E. Marie Kane Chair in Alzheimer's Disease Research, and Director of the Alzheimer's Disease and Memory Disorder Center at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. Welcome to this program on emerging strategies for managing patients who are in the early stages of Alzheimer's disease. Joining me today are Mark Agronin, Vice President for Behavioral Health and Clinical Research at Miami Jewish Health Systems in Miami, Florida. Welcome, Mark. Thank you. And Wanda Spurlock, Associate Professor at Southern University and A&M College School of Nursing in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and also a fellow of the National Gerontological Nursing Association. Welcome, Wanda. Thank you. The goals of this program are to review data on emerging therapies for early Alzheimer's disease, to evaluate the potential impact of these emerging therapies on clinical decision making, and to develop strategies to improve communication around the issue of early Alzheimer's disease with patients and their care partners. I'd like to mention that this program will include a discussion of off-label treatment options. In addition, this program will include a discussion of investigational agents, devices, or diagnostics not approved by FDA for use in the United States. Also, at times during this discussion, we'll pause to ask the audience a few polling questions. Your answers will help us develop future educational activities. Here's our first polling question. Our understanding of Alzheimer's disease pathology is changing. We now know that it begins silently in the brain decades before there are clinical symptoms. The current therapies that are approved for the management of Alzheimer's disease are indicated once dementia is diagnosed. But we can now identify people who are at risk for Alzheimer's disease or who, who are on the pathway toward Alzheimer's disease in the pre-dementia stage. We need to help patients and families understand what's known about this early development, this preclinical phase of Alzheimer's disease, and what's being done to investigate ways to prevent Alzheimer's disease. We also need to emphasize what's important about early diagnosis. Mark, how do we define early Alzheimer's disease? One important thing is to realize that by the time someone comes in with symptoms, the process has likely been going on for a long time. And so we really should think first about risk factors that people may have for developing Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we certainly know that age is the number one risk factor. The older people get, uh, the greater risk there is for developing Alzheimer's disease. Uh, at the same time, there are important factors like diabetes, um, obesity, um, even being female after menopause. These are some important risk factors. There are also some genetic factors that individuals may have, and increasingly we're able to identify these. So again, the first step is to think about what would be some of the general risk categories that someone might be in that might predispose them to Alzheimer's disease. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we're in a new era now. We have things called biomarkers. These are different tests that allow us to actually see some of the very earliest signs of Alzheimer's disease in individu individuals even before they develop symptoms. Over time, the hope is that they will be diagnostic tests. I think as we're seeing over time, they get us very close to being able to make a more accurate diagnosis, but we still have a little ways to go in terms of their development. Uh, we then have individuals who actually begin to show symptoms of cognitive decline, and we may uh, call these individuals uh, as having mild cognitive impairment. So there are clearly some changes in their memory. We don't know if we can attribute it to Alzheimer's disease yet, although, again, if we look at some of the risk factors, we look at biomarkers, it might give us an idea that this is not just mild cognitive impairment due to one or more factors, but it's actually mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's disease because we really want to make sure we intervene at an earlier point. Uh, and then individuals, once we have more of a confirmed diagnosis, either through a combination of biomarkers or history or neuropsychological testing, we really consider this to be early stage Alzheimer's disease. So the disease is really presenting in earnest, and this is a time when we really want to think very seriously about different interventions. But there are, of course, the familial cases of Alzheimer's disease, rare, less than 3% of all the de dementias due to Alzheimer's disease, but when they occur, the chance of getting Alzheimer's disease is 100% if you live long enough, if you have the mutation. That's true. So I think, I think it's useful for people to know that there are already studies underway 
using monoclonal antibodies directed against beta amyloid forming plaques in the brain in people with Alzheimer's disease and that these are studies underway to try to prevent these people with mutations from developing Alzheimer's disease. Um, there are studies in normal people too, uh, normal members of the public who are at a higher risk because of genetic variations like the apolipoprotein E4 genotype um, or people who by the biomarkers that you mentioned look like they're already developing the Alzheimer's process because they have biomarkers that suggest there are, is amyloid in the brain, for example. And studies are underway in these populations, again, with monoclonal antibodies directed against beta amyloid as well as active vaccines and base inhibitors, which block the metabolism of um, amyloid precursor protein into beta amyloid. And then even studies trying to stimulate innate immunity, and maybe we'll talk about that later. It's really a new era for us in terms of earlier intervention because we really see the roots of this disease go back likely decades before we present with symptoms. So all of these different therapies that you talked about really hold the promise of, of uh, intervening at the earliest possible stage. So now that we're in this era, Dr. Spurlock, of identifying people who may be at risk or people who are at risk or maybe even people who are on the pathway, you know, what's the benefit of talking to our patients and their caregivers about this? And also, what's the benefit to making a very early Alzheimer's disease diagnosis? Yes, there are many benefits to an early diagnosis of Alzheimer's. And our research has shown that the majority of persons who seek a cognitive evaluation that they want to know if the cause of their symptoms is due to Alzheimer's disease. So this early diagnosis, of course, um, helps to allay, uh, relieve some of the fear and anxiety that might be centered around the unknown. So it also allows uh, both the patient and family members to um, you know, adopt strategies for healthy uh, brain, uh, brain functioning. But before you get onto the strategies, wasn't there some recent data released by the Alzheimer's Association about what percentage of the population with Alzheimer's actually knows they have Alzheimer's? Yeah, so that was approximately 45 percent of uh, persons who actually received uh, that uh, diagnosis from their uh, health care provider once a, a diagnosis of Alzheimer's had been established. And so we want to really improve those numbers because um, we know that a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease or being told that a person has Alzheimer's disease does not necessarily evoke a catastrophic uh, reaction per se, and it can have uh, positive benefits, especially in terms of uh, adopting treatment strategies that are geared at slowing the disease process and also allows an opportunity to educate both the patient and uh, family caregivers about the importance of adherence, especially to a prescribed uh, medication regimen and other treatments that are really geared toward improving uh, the quality of life. And then, of course, it gives uh, the patient an opportunity, this unique window of opportunity to be an active participant in long-term planning, and that can include you know, care options, uh, maybe future living alternatives, uh, attention to financial and legal concerns. Mm -hmm. And it also allows, um, you know, early connection with uh, social services because today there are more uh, specialized uh, programs that are really geared toward early stage Alzheimer's in terms of uh, caregiver support, uh, adult day programs, uh, even online, uh, you know, memory boards and other methods of keeping them also connected with other caregivers because we want them to know, of course, that they aren't alone. Mm -hmm. And it also provides an opportunity for a more uh, individualized uh, care plan that's aimed at uh, managing other comorbidities such as depression that can occur in the earliest stages of the disease as well as to uh, prevent other, you know, risk uh, complications from occurring. Yeah. I think we've all seen that, you know, people who are forgetful are not the best managers of their own diseases. Their medications, for example. Um, well, are there data that the two of you are aware of that people do better uh, with their comorbid conditions if their diagnosis of Alzheimer's is clear and they're, they're getting the help they need? Right, and they would allow the patient as well as the family member to put some strategies uh, in place such as, uh, you know, pill organizers, uh, you know, reminders and uh, cues because, uh, you know, adherence to that medication regimen will be uh, important. Uh, you know, there's no question that adherence to medications improves. 
in the setting of memory impairment when someone has someone helping them out. Uh, it's an important balance to strike because we want to preserve someone's autonomy as long as possible, but we want to make sure that they're taking the right medication at the right dose, and this does require additional help. So Mark, what constitutes an effective workup for early Alzheimer's disease? It's important to have a comprehensive workup because lots of different things can cause memory changes in late life, and we want to make certain that if we are saying this is Alzheimer's disease, that we have a good amount of certainty and that we certainly don't miss any other medical or psychiatric factors that could be causing symptoms that mimic Alzheimer's disease and that can be treated in different ways. So a comprehensive workup is always going to begin with a really good history, uh, trying to get a timeline. When do the symptoms begin? What types of symptoms? How they changed over time? And are there certain triggers, episodes, occurrences, anything that really seems to be driving the symptoms? Uh, in addition to that, we want to make sure we get a good medical and psychiatric history, a good review of medications. Lots of people end up taking medications that can cause memory impairment or they're ta they take inappropriate medications or too much of a medication. I would say with sleeping pills being one major cause that might not be necessarily the, the absolute cause of the memory or cognitive changes, but certainly can be worsening them. Yeah, well, so when they come in and they're already taking a cholinesterase inhibitor or some other anti-dementia drug, does the history stop there? Is it, is it Alzheimer's disease? That's sometimes what our trainees think. That's right. That can be misleading because usually if someone walks into a primary care office and they have memory complaints, it's not uncommon to be started on a cognitive enhancing medication even without a, real, a really clear evaluation having been done. So that doesn't necessarily make the diagnosis. Uh, so in addition to getting all this history and information, uh, we want to make certain that we've looked at a review of systems. Are there any other symptoms going on uh, that may be representing a, a different uh, entity going on with the person. We want to make certain that we do a, a careful mental status examination and a cognitive screen so we get at issues of mood, uh, how their thinking is. Is there time to do a mental status exam on everybody? Do you have any comments about that? Well, there has to be time and I think that's why having someone see a specialist or a memory center is often going to give them the most comprehensive evaluation. Realistically, I know not everyone has the ability to go to that, but even so, without real due diligence in terms of these, sim these symptoms, the diagnosis might not be as accurate Wanda, as it needs you, to be. Do you find that there's a way to work it in for everybody? Right, and there are various types of mental status exams. Some can be accomplished in a shorter uh, period of time, but I think it's absolutely essential because oftentimes uh, family members can be valid historians, but oftentimes they can start to in ways overcompensate for the patient and not really aware that they're overcompensating. Mm -hmm. So it is really important to get that uh, on the spot. That objective mental test. status. Yeah, and, and that's actually a great point uh, that the informants need to be included because obviously if someone comes in with memory impairment and especially if their insight is not strong, they might not give us the best history. And so having someone who knows them well, who sees their functioning from day to day really will round out that picture. Uh, we want to make certain there's nothing medically going on that we miss, and so uh, basic lab work can be helpful. And then depending on the symptoms, we might decide that a sleep study is necessary or a cardiac workup, but it depends on the context. You know, the real gold standard in terms of seeing the type of cognitive impairment is neuropsychological testing. Now, a lot of people will go to a, a doctor and maybe have a short memory test done, something like the mini mental state examination. That may approximate what's going on, but we really need a full neuropsychological battery to, to get at what are the different symptoms, what are the different degrees of them. And, uh, Do you think that's especially important in early, subtle syndromes of Alzheimer's disease? Uh, it can be important because, one, it establishes a good baseline for comparison later, so that's really critical. Uh, even if the information is not going to point exactly in the direction, it's going to give you the right signals, and again, then you can follow it over time. Uh, you know, and then in addition to this, uh, neuroimaging is really key. Everyone absolutely should have some form of a brain scan. MRIs are going to give us uh, a sharper picture of what's going on. It will pick up a lot of the uh, smaller changes that we might not see in a CT scan. And then beyond that, PET scans have taken on greater importance in terms of uh, diagnosis as well. So how do you think the emerging technology of uh, amyloid imaging and other emerging imaging scans are going to be 
affecting this early diagnosis of Alzheimer's? It's a good question because it's a lot of information and we have to weigh how much closer do we get to actually making a diagnosis. So for instance, if someone does a PET scan uh, using a radioactive glucose tracer, there are certain patterns which are really distinctive for Alzheimer's disease. The, the PET scan that really uh, appears to be changing the way we think about this are the new amyloid-based PET scan. So we can actually get a sense for is there a relative amyloid load in the brain that really seems to be associated with early stage Alzheimer's disease. You know, certainly in terms of research, this is becoming the gold standard in terms of someone qualifying for a, an Alzheimer's disease clinical trial. I would say in practice, it also helps us for some people rule out that it's actually Alzheimer's disease. If you see symptoms and they have a negative scan, it really should push us into looking for other potential causes. So is this a perfect test? I mean, if we just did the amyloid imaging, could we skip the rest of that workup? We don't have enough data to know that at this point. So for instance, if you take 100 people and you give everyone an amyloid test, you will probably have 20 to 30 percent are going to be positive and yet don't show any symptoms. The question is, how many of those individuals will go on eventually to develop Alzheimer's disease. I think we'll know that in the future. We really don't know that today. And there are some false negatives as well, is that That's not true. The case? That's true. true. Wanda, um, how do you talk to patients and their families about this emerging technology? What kind of questions come up and what do you say? Yes, and oftentimes uh, it's a repeat of information that has been given to them by the specialist. I find that oftentimes during the office visit, the patient and the caregivers, their anxiety levels may be to the degree that they aren't really able to process that information. And I also stress to them that a positive, you know, amyloid scan in and of itself is not uh, conclusive of a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. That has to be taken into a larger context with other uh, diagnostic findings. And generally, uh, you know, the caregivers and patients want to know uh, if the procedure will cause them some, uh, you know, discomfort or uh, pain. And so I allay, you know, fears and anxieties that they might have concerning that. And that there might be some um, maybe minor uh, irritation at the injection site, uh, you know, when IV um, intravenous injections of uh, tracers, uh, you know, have to be used. It's not covered by Medicare or other third-party payers. Um, it, people can get this scan, but they have to pay out of pocket. Right. Uh, how, how does that work in your environment? Well, a, uh, a lot of people are reluctant to pay the, the cost because it's quite high. And mm -hmm. so I think we, we try to have a discussion, uh, what will we do with the information? What, what will the yield be with it? And to some extent with a lot of the different testing we do, that's, that's an inherent part of that decision making. Mm -hmm. um, it's time, it's cost for people, it can be an emotionally trying uh, test for people. And so we want to make certain that the information is going to uh, bring us closer to either making a diagnosis or ruling something out uh, and that we can actually do something with it. What are your thoughts, Wanda, about um, current strategies for prevention? Right, and although we can't stop or reverse the onset of Alzheimer's disease, there are steps that uh, persons can take that will improve their overall uh, brain health and also contribute towards uh, healthy aging. So some of these strategies are evidence-based and some are just really grounded in uh, common sense. But we know, first of all, that uh, sleep is really important, um, about six to eight hours uh, nightly, and that not only sleep, but restful quality sleep because that promotes optimal uh, brain functioning. And then we're aware of the many benefits of uh, exercise, and especially uh, exercise, of course, increases the blood uh, flow and oxygenation to the brain, and so that uh, you know, uh, promotes optimal uh, brain functioning. And so we're also aware of some of the other benefits of exercise as well, in terms of, uh, you know, boosting mood and also uh, improving energy. And so there's really um, a body of research that is looking at uh, the connection between uh, heart health and uh, brain health, per se. So measures that individuals can take to improve uh, overall cardiovascular health. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, uh, exercise and diet are uh, important components of uh, cardiovascular health. So there are two types well, of... Uh, when you say diet, you mean just not eating too much or, you know... Well, what, I was going aspect? to refer in terms of uh, two specific types of diets, like the DASH diet and the Mediterranean diet. And so these diets have in common, more or less, uh, whole uh, grain types of uh, foods, uh, fresh uh, fruits and uh, vegetables and also uh, limit 
in terms of uh, sodium and sugary types of uh, foods. What therapies are available by stage for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease? Sure. Well, for individuals with mild Alzheimer's disease, uh, usually the first strategy is to start them on one of the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. There are three of them on the market, and we know from a rich body of data that, uh, well, these are not necessarily slowing the disease process itself, that people can get a symptomatic benefit or some degree of symptomatic stabilization over time. And uh, these are also used not only mild, but also through moderate and severe stages as well. Uh, in addition to the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, which essentially work by boosting levels of acetylcholine, which is a critical neurotransmitter for learning and memory, we also can add to that uh, a glutamate receptor antagonist called memantine, uh, which can work in concert with an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor to also provide some degree of symptomatic boost or stabilization. I think it's critical for uh, patients and, and caregivers to understand that this, these are not cures for the disorder, that their expectations have to be relatively modest because, again, it's a symptomatic boost. It's, it's not necessarily uh, making uh, the person the way they were before. Are there treatment options for MCI? Well, to date, uh, the cognitive enhancing medications have not consistently shown significant improvement when used in mild cognitive impairment. Uh, and so they're not uh, FDA approved for that particular diagnosis. In addition, we really face what we would refer to as a ceiling effect. Individuals have some degree of impairment, but they're still doing pretty well, and so you might not really be able to detect much of a change on these cognitive enhancing medications at that very early stage. Mm -hmm. And yet it's pretty common for people with MCI to be on cholinesterase inhibitors. Is, is that just a matter of individual clinician decision based on what evidence they know? It is very common. Uh, I think in part because mild cognitive impairment versus early stage Alzheimer's disease is often indistinguishable. And so we're hoping that at least if it is early stage Alzheimer's, we're covering it, we're doing something. I think the other thing is that when individuals uh, notice memory changes, especially if they actually get a diagnosis of early Alzheimer's, they really want to do something. They want to take some concrete action. And so cognitive enhancers really become one way of doing that. And I think we would certainly agree that the earlier we start them, the more benefit that we can actually see from these medications. Now, years ago, there was a paper about high-dose vitamin E in moderate Alzheimer's disease, and then very recently, a large-scale VA study supporting similar kinds of benefits. Um, what are your thoughts about high-dose vitamin E for moderate and beyond? Well, I think one of the challenges is that even at best with the existing approved cognitive enhancing medications, the effects are modest. And so vitamin E, the effects are probably even more modest than that. So we might see some slight functional benefit with vitamin E. Uh, there might be, a, one of the studies suggested, a slight uh, lengthening of the time when someone actually needs uh, some form of an institutional care. Uh, I'm not certain that those findings are as meaningful to patients and their families as what we might see with cognitive enhancing medications. So, I don't think vitamin E gets prescribed as much uh, as the cognitive enhancers. I think there might be a role for it, but I do think it's more limited. And are there some downsides, some adverse events? Well, uh, the, the studies of vitamin E used uh, upwards of 2,000 international units a day. And so at that level, uh, there can also be side effects from it. So it's not usually when someone takes a multivitamin, they're getting a much smaller dose of vitamin E. So we're talking about an increase by sometimes a factor of 10 or 20 on the normal dose someone might be taking. Okay. So we talked about conventional therapies primarily for the Alzheimer's dementia from the earliest stages and beyond. But um, there are also in this, in this subgroup of patients a number of experimental interventions underway that's probably worth mentioning. Um, probably by number, more patients are enrolled in studies of physical and mental exercise as a way to prevent mild cognitive impairment from getting worse to becoming recognizable Alzheimer's disease. And, and particularly in Europe, um, there are a number of, of ongoing studies. And then, of course, there's the attempt to repurpose drugs from other indications, such as attention deficit disorder, or um, the use of neurotransmitter-based therapies. Uh, after all, neurotransmitter 
enhancement is how we develop the cholinesterase inhibitors in the first place. So there are a number of these studies, uh, a very high profile study with intranasal insulin to try to improve metabolism in the brain. Um, the monoclonal antibodies that I talked about earlier being used in prevention paradigms are also being studied in MCI. And um, more recently, some studies of stimulating innate immunity. So I, I think it's hopeful that uh, just as we have studies for prevention, we continue to have studies for MCI where we have no FDA approved therapies. Let's let the audience weigh in on this topic now. Wanda, what complementary strategies do you see patients using in addition to the kinds of therapies that we talked about? Yeah, some of the nutraceuticals, and it's important to uh, mention that these are dietary supplements and they do not require a physician's uh, prescription. And it's also uh, important to remember that the rigorous type of scientific research that undergirds the approval of uh, prescription medication is not required for the marketing of uh, dietary supplements and uh, medical foods. But some of these, uh, well, they're referred to as natural remedies, and they can include uh, ginkgo and uh, jellyfish extract uh, that's thought to be used as a memory enhancer, and then also a form of a medical food. Now, the medical food, such as uh, Exona, it does uh, require a prescription. And uh, it's all. But, but let me stop here for a second. Uh, you know, the, the nutraceuticals, the supplements and vitamins, mm -hmm. you know, they cannot market themselves as treatments for Alzheimer's disease. No. They have to really talk about symptoms. Right. And yet I think oftentimes the public doesn't realize the difference. If a, if a drug, if a, a treatment or a, a supplement says this is good for memory or this is good for age related cognitive changes. Mm -hmm the assumption is that that would be good for Alzheimer's disease. Right. So I guess that's another important distinction between a, um, a supplement and a, an FDA approved drug. Right, that is not marketed for the treatment of a specific uh, disease such as Alzheimer's disease. But, but when it comes to the medical foods, can they be prescribed by a physician for a specific disease? I guess, you know, the, the technical wording is that it's prescribed for a deficiency state, mm -hmm. a nutritional deficiency state that can be associated with a disease. With a disease. Yeah. Correct. So what, what, how does the uh, um, caprylic acid approach work? Well, it, it's based on the theory that um, early on in Alzheimer's disease, we begin to lose metabolism in our brain. And this, uh, at least, is attributed to the uh, lessening ability of brain cells to, to take in glucose. Mm -hmm. And so the theory is that if there's a way to circumvent that by giving someone this medium chain fatty acid, the body converts it into ketone bodies, and brain cells can use ketone bodies just like they use glucose as, in essence, an alternative fuel source. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, at least, some uh, preliminary looks at this, uh, in particular, individuals who do not carry a certain genetic marker, the apolipoprotein E4, one, which is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. Those, those individuals uh, might get some symptomatic benefit from this, and that's being uh, studied more rigorously currently. In controlled clinical trials? Yes, yes. Okay. How do you communicate to somebody that they have early Alzheimer's? How do you advise them about communicating this to other people? What are some of the things um, Wanda, that, that come up in these discussions? Well, it's important to really to have a discussion with the patient and their caregivers concerning, you know, how or if they would really like to inform other family members or friends of their diagnosis and to take into consideration that this is a, a, a personal decision that has to be uh, looked at within the context of the family structure, uh, you know, quality of uh, pre-existing, um, you know, relationships. So that's really a personal decision. But we find that oftentimes talking about uh, the diagnosis in and of itself may help uh, others to, well, to better understand, you know, changes that the person may be uh, experiencing and then also maybe what to expect in the future. To help them interpret the phenomenology. But are there mm -hmm. better ways to tell people that they have Alzheimer's than not? I mean, are there good ways and bad ways to communicate that message? 
Well, I think uh, more or less important um, factor is uh, what the element of uh, truthfulness and honesty. And some patients will come out and say, you know, tell me, I want to know if I have Alzheimer's disease. And whereas, uh, you know, the pe uh, persons may more or less be a little more, uh, you know, reluctant and not really wanting to know what the exact diagnosis is. So I think that has to be uh, decided on in, um, within the context of the patient and the relationship that they have with the health care provider. Do you have these kinds of communication concerns? This, does, this comes up, although I find it comes up less over time. There's greater awareness of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, I think starting with Ronald Reagan coming out with this diagnosis, uh, celebrities like Glenn Campbell and uh, the movie Still Alice really is bringing greater awareness of this disease. Um, there's less stigma about it. People feel less shame about it. And so they do want to know and they want their families to know. And we encourage that and we often help people on how they can communicate this to friends and family and how they can communicate it to children and grandchildren as well. Because the more people understand, the more they're involved in the process, the more support people get. Mm -hmm. And that's really what it should be all about. Yeah, I find that sometimes helps the family to lighten up, you know, yes. when they can just kind of laugh about it. It's so. very true. It's a long course. Okay. And here's our final polling question. So to wrap up this discussion, which I think has been pretty extensive, um, pretty practical, uh, covered a lot of topics, um, I think that we've covered the important question of what's happening in the field around early Alzheimer's disease. That in research, which will someday be practice, we're detecting people at risk in a sort of epidemiologic population-based way. Mm -hmm. Or we're detecting people who are at risk by their genetic background. Or we're detecting people who we think, on the preponderance of the evidence, including biomarkers, are already on the pathway and developing Alzheimer's disease. Right now, we can't offer them a therapy. We can offer them participation in research. But we are avidly seeking therapies that we can offer people that modify their risk or that delay the progression of that decades-long silent period of Alzheimer's disease. We've also talked about what early Alzheimer's disease really is. And uh, Mark, you've made the point that it completely overlaps with what we're calling mild cognitive impairment. It's a moment in a disease process that unfolds over decades when we can actually say this person is impaired and we can document it and measure the degree of impairment and we can rule out the usual things that might be causing that impairment and we can say now we know that what is happening to this person is a kind of brain failure related to the neurodegenerative changes of Alzheimer's disease. What can be done? We talked about the therapies that exist. Uh, we talked about prevention. We talked about common sense modifications of, of general risk and, and maintenance of brain health, but we also talked about treatments. And Mark, you took us through the treatments for early Alzheimer's disease, mild, moderate, severe. Um, we talked about what's going on experimentally at the different stages from prevention to MCI. We didn't talk a lot about experimental therapies for Alzheimer's disease, but there's overlap there as well. And finally, we talked about the importance of making this early diagnosis, mm -hmm. how the benefits from what I heard you say clearly outweigh the risks. And um, we help people to understand what's happening to them and their loved ones. We are obligated to help them try to communicate that to other people to derive the kinds of support, psychosocial and pharmacological and other non-pharmacologic supports that they need um, to get through having Alzheimer's disease. So the importance of making that early diagnosis, communicating it first to the patient and his or her family, and then finally to those around them. Wanda and Mark, I'd like to thank you both for participation in this interesting and I hope very useful discussion. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for participating in this activity.
You may now click on the Earn CME Credit link to take the CME post-test and evaluation. Thank you.